Okay, well, I think we will get going with our public safety conversation. Uh, my name is Brian Shepard. I'm the uh, Broadband Program Manager with the Governor's Office of Information Technology, and I'm also the single point of contact for the FirstNet initiative here in Colorado. Uh, also, my background, I uh, come from uh, eight years in a public safety answering point, a 911 center here in Colorado, uh, working on next generation 911 issues and overall public safety communication. So, um, I've got uh, some background in this. Uh, before we get going with our questions, I want to have our panel introduce themselves and just say a couple quick uh, words about uh, their background and their perspective on uh, public safety and how we address all these issues we've been talking about today in a very, very unique situation, which is public safety. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon. My name is Dave Sainert. I am a uh, senior consultant at Mission Critical Partners. My specialty focuses on Next Gen 911, and I uh, look forward to providing some insight to some of the PSAP and state and local authorities on the challenges that are facing uh, the PSAPs and local government as they uh, look to implement Next Gen 911, maintain Next Gen 911, and some are in, in simply in the stages of planning for uh, Next Gen 911. Hi, my name is Catherine Condello. I'm Director of National Security and Emergency Preparedness for CenturyLink. Um, I'm going to be taking the perspective today in terms of public safety a little bit broader uh, because I am fortunate to work with all the critical infrastructure sectors who all in some way or another do support the public safety. So, um, and I'm currently the Chair of the Communications Sector Coordinating Council along with um, Chris Boyer, who spoke earlier from AT&T, and Larry Walk, who was also here earlier. Uh, so I'll be taking things from that perspective today. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Dave Simpson, I'm the Chief of the Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau at the FCC, uh, and I've got a, a career in the IT systems uh, and uh, cyber arena. Um, a particular interest at the FCC uh, in public safety networks is really the next generation, is next generation 911, uh, is the, uh, the next generation of alerting uh, and ensuring that we together with the industry uh, and our public safety partners are uh, proactively looking at the risk associated with those next generation systems to make sure that we're addressing up front um, those risks, uh, recognizing that uh, public safety in general is a risk averse bunch. We don't want to be on the bleeding edge and we don't want to be on the bleeding edge, uh, but we're in the part of a tra transition where the the legacy uh, infrastructure is going away, and so we need to work that sunset piece. Um, and while we're next generation focused, we're also mindful that uh, sometimes your greatest vulnerabilities are in the sunset of legacy technology. Uh, and as there's no real um, rational incentive to invest in security uh, when you're in the very end of a technology cycle. so. Uh, making sure that that risk for the introduction of the new generation is balanced with uh, keeping an eye on our six. Hello, I'm John Belts. I'm the IT Security Manager of Public Safety Communications Research, P PSCR, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And um, I basically uh, manage all of the security-focused research projects that are being conducted at PSCR. And also, we are uh, currently embedding security into all of our research projects, you know, uh, baked in security approach. So that's the uh, perspective I'll be bringing today. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Hans Peterson. I'm the principal security architect for Intrado. My background comes from intrusion analysis. I'm a certified intrusion analyst, a firewall analyst, a um, forensic analyst, Windows security administrator, penetration tester. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So my background is largely cybersecurity. Who just happens to work in telecom for Intrado? And the, the perspective I'm going to be bringing is looking to take all the legacy systems from PSAPs and our legacy systems at Intrado into this new world of next uh, of next gen. So before we get our questions, I just want to set a little bit of the understanding when we talk about public safety networks and the uniqueness of them. When we talk about the next generation 911 network or the first net network or public safety communications, you have to realize we have an extremely federated, decentralized, multi stakeholder approach. For example, in Colorado alone, there's 95 911 centers. And some of those 911 centers are still using pen and paper 
to take the calls in and to, and, and disseminate the information. Uh, we have 1,400 public safety entities, ranging from uh, the Denver Police Department to small volunteer fire departments with not a single paid staff. Uh, all of those with their own network connections, some of them being T1, some of them being 100 meg pipes to the internet. Um, and so we have to really look at all that. We have local, federal uh, stakeholders. Um, when we talk about mandating security standards or so forth, you have to ask the questions, do we have the statutory and legal authority to do that? Uh, you know, we, if the, the federal government says we mandate this security standard, we have folks across this country at the state level government that will say you have no ability to tell me what to do or what not to do. So how do we get? How do we do that? Um, you know, when we talked about uh, earlier, we we're talking about vulnerabilities and uh, reacting to an event. Well, we, there's potential in the future where you may know you have a vulnerability. You may be in the middle of a situation and you realize we've been compromised. But if you close that gap, if you close that port, you shut off communication to your first responders. So what do you do? If you know you're being actively attacked and yet your, your ability to shut that down is limited by the ability of, to deal with your current incident, what do you do? How do you react to those types of things? And so those are the things we have to think about as we talk about public safety communications and what we do in a security perspective. So our first question is gonna be next generation I01, essentially the ability to send text, video, pictures, all that kind of rich multimedia that we've come to expect. In the future, we'll be able to send that to an I01 dispatch center. Well, you can embed all kinds of nasty things we just heard about in pictures and videos and, and, and emails and texts. And an I01 dispatcher has about two seconds to take a piece of information in and, and disseminate that. They don't have the ability to sit down and, and look at the email and say, ooh, I think that's one of those phishing emails. They're gonna get a piece of information and click on it. So how do we, how do we, how do we secure a 911 network when we have to not only just secure it, but we have to make sure that we pass that information on and secure it in real time and allow that person that gets that information to essentially have the confidence that they can open that without any kind of repercussion. This, uh, my view on this is that we need to, this needs to be approached in a manner that looks at the full spectrum of, uh, of a, in this case, a, an MMS or a text message with, with media attached and looking at the multiple points in which that can enter the network. Uh, if we take a look at the applications themselves, um, if, and there's many different, if you do a search on 911 on the iTunes store, for example, you'll find multiple, uh, probably dozens of different applications that are trying to sell their tools to the general public, uh, many of which probably have no idea of the operation that goes on at a 911 call center. Uh, so as we look to the future and these applications, we need to look at what the what what are the entry criteria for these systems, for these applications, I should say. Um, from there, you're looking at the at the applications, the core next gen core services that will be processing these requests for service need to be uh, taking into consideration that the, the point that Brian made is that the uh, the call taker has literally seconds to make a decision and they don't one of those decisions should be should I trust this data everything that falls on their desktop should be trusted in my opinion when it gets gets to that point certainly uh, we need to rate it we need to educate and continue to inform uh, all all aspects of public safety to understand the potential vulnerabilities but I think our starting point is to make that assumption that they that those call takers are going to trust that data that's on their screen. They've been working in a world of uh, location data that has been well somewhat trusted uh, for 30, 40 years, and I, I, I say somewhat trusted in that address data for location information has been challenging over the last 15 years with with mobile and VoIP technology, which is a, a very big topic of discussion within the FCC today. Um, so within those tools, within the core, I think looking at uh, tools that would uh, potentially uh, quarantine a, an item upon arrival and until which a time in which it can, be, it can be shared. And there's a lot of complications behind that and I, I can't go into all those details nor do I have the subject matter expertise to speak to what those applications would be required to do. But those are just a few of my thoughts. I'm going to pass. <laughs> Thanks. First, let me take the opportunity to uh, respond to something you said at your intro, and that's that uh, a federal regulator might think that they'd ever 
uh, have the authority to regulate cybersecurity for PSAPs. I, I don't know what federal regulator thinks that. Uh, I know at the FCC, uh, uh, we absolutely don't think that. Um, uh, not only is it outside our authorities, but it's wrong. It's just the wrong way to approach cybersecurity. Uh, I, I've been around cyber long enough to know that if you don't own your own cyber risk, you're doomed to failure. Uh, you've got to appreciate it within your own enterprise and make decisions with your own enterprise on what's right. If somebody up top, certainly if somebody at the federal level says, this is what you've got to do for your cybersecurity, you will always be behind the threat because the adversary is much more agile than a federal regulator would be in prescribing what you need to do to defend your own networks. So my message is exactly the opposite. Don't expect the feds to secure your PSAPs. Don't expect the feds to secure your PSAPs. You need to secure your PSAPs. You need to own your cyber risk. And you within the states, I think, need to be a facilitator for helping your jurisdictions continue to be safe as the technology underneath them shifts to a packet-based orientation. The feds aren't going to protect you, and we're not going to define the list that you need to protect your own networks. You've got to own that risk. Uh, related to that, as far as uh, the multimedia aspects of Next Generation 911, uh, I, I think it's very important to have um, kind of a Maslow's hierarchy of, of need with regard to uh, 911 capabilities. Uh, and we need to think about this in terms of graceful degradation. You've got to protect at that core uh, a voice call to 911. Uh, and, and you want to uh, bias your operations so that you're not exposing that to undue uh, risk from uh, uh, multimedia. Uh, and then out, outside of that text and then go uh, to images and, and, and perhaps video. And within that, not just the kind of media, but the where is it coming from too. So I think whitelists and blacklists uh, have a su significant role in, in this. A camera uh, image coming from the Colorado Department of Transportation on a highway cam uh, would have a different degree of trust than a picture coming from a car that has never contacted uh, uh, the PSAP before. Uh, I think in that graceful degradation piece, that uh, the hierarchy of uh, uh, risk postures, we very much need to segment risk. Uh, and there's no reason why you have to commingle uh, images uh, with the uh, uh, voice communications. It, it, you can uh, isolate that risk, uh, both cryptographically, but also physically. Um, and I, I think you very much want to have the concept that you described of, of a quarantine of, uh, of images, uh, you know, bring it into a sad sandbox, it, explode it, actually launch it in that controlled sandbox environment. You can do that machine to machine automatically. And if it doesn't successfully pass that within the sandbox, I exploded it and, and nothing bad happened, uh, then you pass it on. Um, there's going to need to be an evaluation of images anyway as we start to think about the task of the call takers, the, uh, the telecommunicators uh, in PSAS, where you, you don't necessarily want them to um, see every gory image that might be available around a possible accident scene uh, or a, 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 a mass casualty situation. Uh, and and you're, you're going to want to have a, a records management concept um, that triages what information is looked at when uh, uh, by your telecommunicators. So I, I think there's a lot of moving parts there, uh, but it's important that we begin to identify best practices and an objective approach to that so that we don't wind up with 6,500 different capability suites, jurisdiction by jurisdiction by jurisdiction across the country and uh, evolve to the point where we thought 911 was a universal capability, and pretty much anywhere around the nation, you call 911, you know where you can get to where you got to keep a scorecard and say, well, in this county, I can do a voice called 911, I can't do text, but I could send an image. Uh, it, you know, we, we, we really need to create that next generation objective state where we've properly addressed risk, but we also deliver upon the public's expectations of 911 being a universal service. Uh, first of all, I'd like to explain that at PSCR, we have been very much focused on um, 
public safety broadband networks, and we do not have a focus on next generation 911. Um, so I can provide some general information, but it's not our area of specialties. Um, I definitely agree that it has to be a network level function. I don't think the end user is going to be responsible to make that sort of decision. So what we're really looking at is um, gateway gateway appliances that are able to do you know do the same sort of things that our traditional networks are doing for you know for filtering and you know looking for malicious malicious content and messages. Uh, one thing we are looking at in the public safety broadband networks is the idea of. Um, you know, when the network becomes saturated, there are automatic triggers within the network to, con to control the network traffic. It, so while it's not the same exact thing, it might be things such as, okay, so the, the network is overly saturated, so there has to be a change in what sort of traffic is allowed, what, what format, right? The, so the videos and, and the photos might be, not be allowed during those times, but you keep your critical services, such as voice and, and possibly the you know, SMS, which is not using that amount, the same amount of traffic. Those are my general responses. And from the technical aspect of looking at the, something like MMS and embedded attacking, there's a, there's a function that has to happen that renders an MMS or a video stream in, and in embedded in that particular video stream has to be the exploit that we're talking about, that the malware that then triggers it. If we render it first and re-record it into a different format and send it into the PSAP, but it's basically achieving sanitation, then uh, we're eliminating that risk at that point. And that's, that's one of the ways I think we need to go. We're taking any ingress points that will be able to, set, to successfully render it with fully patched systems, whether it, whether it could be video, QuickTime, movie format, whatever, and then transferring it into a format that still is lossless, but then sends a sanitized version into the PSAP so that we're not relying on PSAP equipment to have antivirus or whatever, because if anyone who's ever visited a PSAP uh, that has no internet access and looks at what the patch level is, it's staggering. <laughs> and not staggering in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> so this next question gets a little bit more to the idea of a first net and the public safety wireless network, but I think does apply a little bit to a, a, a land-based, so to speak, public safety network or next gen 911 network, but it gets to identity management. One of the things we've been talking about is once we start getting smart devices in the hands of first responders, we can't end up logging in 15, 16 to, you know, different times and databases. So we've discussed, hey, you know, biometrics, that kind of thing. Uh, well, then what happens though if a bad person gets a hold of that device and can log in to the, to the network now and has access? So uh, the question is, should public safety go with a stricter identi identity management scenario and should we have standards, I won't use the word mandate, should we have standards nationwide in terms of passcodes, what apps can and cannot be put onto a public safety device, um, and you know, uh, you know, basic things, encryption levels, those types of things uh, at a nationwide level. I'll offer just a couple thoughts on this, and, and one, is, one being that uh, I think that more automated capabilities and ident identification and identification management is, is necessary uh, to the point that uh, um, keeping tra track of one more username, password, uh, token IDs, things of that sort, I think are just uh, should become a thing of the past. We need to look to more towards biometrics, voice printing, things of that sort to try and uh, move movement uh, to higher technologies there. The other piece is uh, around enforcement of any nationwide standard. I think will become a, will become a challenge, or will be a challenge right off the, right out of the starting gate. Uh, so enforcement of any of those capabilities is going to be will be hard to come by. Um, so I, don't, I really don't have a good good thought or a good uh, concrete idea on what that's going to look like. Um, but as it, as it gets rolled out, it needs to be thought of at the very most basic user level in the most remote parts of this nation. Um, and the very end where technology maybe is uh, maybe the, the gun that's in the holster, um, not necessarily the, the computer that's on the dashboard. Uh, good luck with a national standard about what you can download and what you can't, uh, speaking as a formerly wireless person. Um, I, I, I think the question sort of actually begs the, the solution, and I think you can't beg to the solution until you've sort of stepped back to the, so what is it I'm trying to protect? You know, there's gonna be some things where, you know, you're gonna want uh, NSA squared type whatever to sort of lock down, and other stuff, no. 
Um, there are certainly lots and lots of tools and, and applications and techniques and protocols that one can use to achieve what you're trying to achieve, but you have to be articulate about is what is it I want to achieve. So if, for instance, you think it's unlikely, as I do, that you'd be able to tell Kentucky that they can't download something that Tennessee doesn't want, good luck there. Um, you can, though, you can say, here's a way, here's a protocol, here's something we can do nationally so that irrespective of you know, what the app is, maybe there is a place where you curate apps, I don't know. My point is, you have to be able to articulate what's the goal and then go for the solution here. So just to say that should we have stricter identity management in the absence of what is it I need to be stricter about seems to be, in my mind, putting the cart a little bit before the horse. Yeah, I really agree with Catherine that um, we need to not think of an ICAM solution uh, identity solution. We need to think of a range of uh, solutions that is oriented around what is it you want to protect. At that base level, the ability to take a voice 911 call, um, I really want to protect availability. Right? Yep. The call's got to go through. Um, at a higher level, I'm looking at um, value added information, which may uh, contribute positively or may not contribute positively to my response. Um, uh, but carries with it a uh, greater long-term th threat to um, my responder recovery challenge if I let that in an unsecure way, um, then I, I would want a, a, uh, a stronger um, identification posture uh, or, or something more oriented towards that, that uh, greater risk to the network than there would be value of the information getting through. So I think it <coughs> needs to, to, to be balanced uh, I think we also need to look at hi history here, particularly with regard to uh, FirstNet. Uh, if we look in the land mobile radio uh, space and we uh, look how hard it was when we implemented encryption of radio channels, uh, that the very, uh, uh, well, first encryption came about because, uh, A, the public's listening into first responder communications uh, and in a uh, mass casualty situation, uh, uh, there were times where that created some problems. So we, the response was we brought in, in, in encryption. Uh, but then the first time mutual aid was required and you had another jurisdiction roll in and suddenly the keys for the different in, in, in encryption protocols weren't exchanged ahead of time uh, and they didn't really have a way to bring in those uh, 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 forest fire uh, jumpers that came from California to help out Colorado or vice versa. Uh, uh, then suddenly it was, whoa, let's go back to unencrypted. So I think we ne need to not make that mistake. We need to plan from the very beginning in FirstNet and NextGen 901 on how do we federate uh, in a manner that has a good enough sharing, a good enough um, access to resources uh, uh, planned out with a number of different ICAM solutions. Uh, FICAM on the federal side is, is very much uh, uh, a PIV card, PIV card uh, orientation, uh, and uh, but in many local jurisdictions, that is really too heavy a uh, an ICAM architecture. And uh, I cubed uh, uh, favors SAML and, and other kinds of assertions uh, that are equally valid. Um, and I, I don't think that we want to think in just terms of a single uh, uh, ICAM, but we really want to think of interoperability. Uh, between ICAM, given how many public safety entities th th there are out there. And the, the last thing I, I just want to uh, push back a little bit on, on biometrics, because uh, I have a whole new um, orientation towards biometrics since the OPM breach, with the full knowledge that uh, several million of my best friends have all 10 of their fingerprints uh, <laughs> digitized in a database in China. Uh, uh, the, the thing with biometrics, while it, it has a very light uh, applicability when you want to do that swipe real quick and you're in, uh, on the back end, in the respond and recover side, once your biometric credentials are compromised, mm -hmm. it's really hard to issue somebody a new set of biometric credentials. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I'm actually not a fan of uh, uh, relying, over relying on biometrics. It, uh, I know the hell of a place. But I would hope that we don't over rely on it. So it sounds like we're uh, the panel is in agreement that you know identity management is 
going to be absolutely important to protect the public safety networks. Um, there are 56 different states and territories and 60,000 60, different local responder agencies that could potentially be using this network. And uh, with all the sensitive data that's going to be transmitted, it's imperative that there's some way to validate not only the identity of the user, but also the devices that they are using. Um, so NIST, uh, PFCR and NIST actually recognized this. Um, within the question was brought up NIST IR8014 which actually um, gives some background information and kind of collects all the presiding data within that's available to us and presents it in a, in a more public safety format. So if you haven't uh, had the privilege of reading that, I would ask you to do so. <laughs> uh, beyond that, we're uh, PSCR, we're also looking into uh, more um, broad, we're, look, we're working with NSTIC, which is the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. Uh, they've been showing us uh, a bunch of large-scale identity management solutions, both in industry and in the federal government. Um, we're looking at the, you know, the things from those different solutions that actually could work for public safety networks, and we're also looking at some of the gaps that, um, you know, from from where they currently, how they currently work, to where we need to go on the public safety networks. Whereas, um, you know, PSCR could be helpful in, in trying to bridge those gaps. Um, also, I'd like to address the discussions on you know, biometrics and token, the, you know, the different ways we're going to we're going to perform the actual authentication. Um, with when we're dealing with first responders, uh, the the way they can authenticate is going to be quite a bit different than than some of the other identity management solutions that we've seen, because of the you know, the equipment that they have to use, and because of the the need for expedient authentication and emergency solutions. Um, it's quite a different animal. So I also wanted to point out that there's been some research at NIST on that. There's a NIST IR8080 that goes into great detail about the usability needs for the first responders when it comes to authentication. Since the panel has mostly uh, covered everything about the identity management point, I will touch upon the whitelisting and uh, uh, the general security profile of PSAPs. Yes, I think we could create a standard for what should, what could or should be installed in terms of software, in terms of local user security profiles and um, which antivirus systems to use, which kind of encryption to use. Uh, NINES, NGSEC standard 75001 has done, done a good job of going out with an initial framework. Some of the uh, ideas in there have turned out to not really be enforceable. For example, make sure that your password system does not enforce that there's three real words inside of your password. Is nearly impossible for any legacy system out there, but most of it as a framework is, is a very good start, and it's uh, it's something to think about. If we could unify the PSAPs and make their the security at, at their level uh, better, then we all stand to gain from that. Just a plug for NIST over here. Uh, uh, NIST IR I just recently become uh, uh, knowledgeable on. Uh, and not, not to be dangerous, on your NIST product for ICANN. It's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and a NIST IR is a NISTer. <laughs> so if you hear any of us talking about a NISTer, <laughs> yeah. that's what it is. Um, from a practical perspective, the, the conversation about encryption with ML radio, I would echo that. that you know, from my perspective, take away you know, your, your very tactical, you know, strategic, your SWAT teams, your focused groups where you know what you're good doing and to me the encryption is it's almost more of a burden from, a, from to manage communications at a public safety level and a, a, uh, with a lot of first responders. You know, the, the agencies that wanted to use encryption to us, it was, it was it was more of a nightmare than it was worth, you know, like I said, with, with a few small exceptions. So I think that it's critical that we figure that out. Um, I'm gonna kind of combine the next two questions because they, they get to similar points just from a different perspective. One, really it has to do with, we're talking about uh, a non-heterogeneous network here. We're talking about multiple devices, multiple endpoints, multiple entities with their own standards, maybe some standard frameworks, uh, their own implementations. Some use private infrastructure, some use public infrastructure, some use ISPs, some use their own municipal networks. Um, and so, you know, and, and BYOD, uh, I think that that's a big point to get to is that some of these uh, entities are going to, you know, give a volunteer for a public safety event. You have a lot of volunteers that you simply have their own devices, and you're going to want them to download the app that you use. Um, so with that, that, that perspective, the first question is, do we want to do end-to-end -end encryption across the network? 
I know when we addressed this with the minimum technical standards for the first net effort, we said yes, right off. We said, of course, we want to, we want to curb this end to end. And then one of the engineers in the room said, do you have any idea what you're going to do to your performance if you, if you want to do that? Um, so that's the first question is, do we encrypt end to end? And the second question is, when we get into procurement and management of these devices, again, how the heck do we do this uh, across this network where we're going to have a multitude of options for this? I'll, uh, I'll address this question from the standpoint of uh, maybe not the full end-to-end -end of the spectrum, but maybe uh, the voice call itself and getting that, that uh, the call, the 911 call from the origination point to the, to the, to the PSAP. Um, my belief is, well, I guess just taking a, a step back and looking at all of this, it's about balance. And uh, the technology that we have and the capabilities that we may be able to bring to to the PSAP is fantastic. Um, what do we want to layer in or bring in all the all the information, all the data all at once, or do we want to bring this in a, a piece at a time? Ultimately, the networks need to be designed and network and need to be designed for the baseline minimum cap cap capability that you need to pr provide. And that's that's getting that voice call across, getting the location data with that with that voice call. Uh, as far as encrypting that that from point A to point Z, or maybe let's say point X, because Z is going to be that first responder in the field. Um, I think it's uh, it's going to be when you're looking at how many players are in this in this call flow. Uh, are you looking at multiple uh, points, or is it simply a origination point with that the call uh, at the switch, and then into the core services, and then to the the PSAP, or are we having multiple hops along the way? I think ultimately that'll help us uh, address that concern about the latency and the challenges that we're going to have. Um, so I don't really have a clear yes, no answer. I think it's going to be dependent on each uh, locality's implementation of their services and, and what ultimately are, all are they putting on to that, that, the delivery of that call. Uh, it comes back down to the, the Maslow hierarchy again. Um, yes, you're going to have a wide diversity, heterogeneous networks. But there's going to need to be some oversight, some governance, some determination that notwithstanding all the variability throughout the entire United States, there is, to your point, you know, a presumption of some common service, some common, as a citizen, I'm going to dial 911 or what I'm going to do, and there's going to be a presumption I'm going to get some basic thing. Recognizing that you understand what the basic thing is, you know, in my mind and in the way that we've been looking at it, certainly at a sector level, it's sort of like, what is the most essential mission, you know, or the first top three or four or five? And then for each one of those, do I need for mission number one, end-to-end -end encryption, to make sure, to assure myself that it will continue to go through? And if the answer is yes, then you need to, to, to take a look at it. And if the answer is no, then you go on to next number two. To assure that the second most important function happens, do I, does, you know, end-to-end -end encryption sort of support that? And, 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 and that, in my mind, is what, you know, certainly the, the public safety broadband network, the first nets, the next generation, next generation one, those entities that are sort of working out these governance factors do need to be able to articulate. I don't know that they need to articulate how it gets done, but I think they do need to articulate what the end goal needs to be, because, once again, it's going to be heterogeneous, it's going to be regional, and, and there'll be a lot, but if you can express this is how, I, this is what I want the outcome to be, then the solution will, can present itself. Yeah, and, and Catherine, I agree with you uh, entirely. And, um, and That's I surprising. Think it is. <laughs> well, you would note this. Um, uh, I'm teasing. <laughs> no, it's good. I'm teasing back. Uh, uh, that's called flirting ah. <laughs> um, between the regulator and the uh, uh, secretary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, I think. Part of this is not all encryption is created equal. It's created equal, right? Uh, that uh, there is heavy encryption. There is AES-256, but then there's also uh, encryption around transactions. And so the point was made earlier in the last panel that what you really want to protect is the data. Uh, and I think in the public safety um, example, um, in some respects, the data is actually secondary to the transaction. You want to you want to uh, protect. Uh, transactions because you ha do have this bias towards availability. Um, and uh, I, I think what we really want to look at is a um, protected uh, architecture that has uh, uh, 
just enough encryption for the function you're trying to achieve within the various layers of that architecture uh, without negatively encumbering uh, the original function that you set out to achieve by I including that, that new element of next generation 911, uh, 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 texting, videos, uh, images. Yeah, and I can, I can add to that. Uh, it sounds like you know, the, we understand that we can't encrypt all, we can't provide end to end encryption for all communications. It's, it's going to have to be, um, you know, they're very sensitive communications that are going to have to absolutely have end to end encryption. Uh, there could be times where layer encryption is needed, and there could be times where there's no encryption is needed. Um, we've taken a look at that at PSCR and um, you know, kind of taken the NIST risk management framework that we've all heard about many times today. Uh, one of the things you want to do first is identify your data types and what the sensitivity, sensitivity impact level is of those. So we have um, actually held workshops with uh, first responders and other members of the, com the community to identify all the different types of data that might exist on this network and attempted by working with them and getting feedback to apply those impact levels. So I can envision um, you know, a scenario where depending on what the impact level rating was depends on you know, what type of encryption was necessary for that. Um, I also know that one of the ways, and, and this will kind of tie into the, the second question where we can't manage, we can't fully manage all the devices. We can't, we can't validate the security control settings on every single device that we're using. Um, we may be able to do that. I, I think we're, we might be able to do that for some of the devices that you know are connecting to the core. We might be able to for devices that you know don't fall within that category. We might be uh, sending either standards or guidelines to the local agencies as to how that you know what devices they can use. There might be certified devices, you know. That, are certified for all public safety users from the vendors. Um, and then some, there might be BYOD, where we, you'll have very little control over the security controls on those devices. Uh, I think one thing that could work for all of those is if we're looking at the, the applications themselves, uh, we're looking, we're, we're currently researching a secure container and application virtualization, where it doesn't necessarily matter what platform you're running on as far as the operating system and the hardware because you're, you're segregating that via, via containerization from, from that environment. From there, that application can create its own VPN connection back to the server, you know, whatever resources you're, try, you know, you're trying to connect to to transmit data. And I think that, that definitely could provide value in a scenario where it, doesn't, it literally doesn't matter what level of control you have over the device itself because your application can perform, can perform that function. Sure. If I could uh, agree and then add to what John's saying, I think you're in a real sweet spot here that we need to, as we look forward, not to think of persona identities, but there's machine identities, yeah. uh, and then there's where they're being used. Uh, and I think this will be much more like uh, the credit industry, where you look at a credit card transaction uh, and you uh, look at the total a number of indicators, where is it the kind of transaction that that individual had before? Is it the kind of store that is a high risk or low risk store? Is it the country that that, that person is normally in? And, and, and that uh, rapidly comes up with a risk indicator that says, let that transaction go on without further study. Uh, I, I think it'll be the same thing as we go forward in public safety, that we really have a fixed population of uh, machine identities we have to deal with. Yeah. Um, and if we look at, does the machine identity make sense with the person who's accessing it, make sense with the transaction that they're looking to accomplish, let it go forward. Uh, and, uh, and have that risk-based uh, orientation. So as we look on encryption and as an end to end means to achieve a goal from a cell phone or from a VoIP phone perspective, encryption takes processing power, it takes bandwidth on a network that is continuously being more and more saturated, mostly due to Netflix. Um, as we look at that, we at Entrato have, we look at the CIA triad, the confidentiality and the integrity and the availability of a, a network call. And as it pertains to voice call, availability is the biggest one in there that the voice call goes through and doesn't get uh, impacted by jitter or by, um, say, an encryption session has to be sent up before set up before you can make your phone call. Encryption fails because there's a key problem, et cetera. And now I can't make my, my phone call to 911. That is 
not a technical solution. So therefore, availability is huge in Outlook. Uh, I did want to add one thing when uh, I mentioned that we were looking at the various data types that would be, be transmitted over the network. Um, it was one of the interesting findings was that especially during an actual incident, during an emergency or a disaster, almost everything was high for confidentiality and high for integrity. It might have changed after the event was was finished, but during that time, so you know, it is <laughs> high impact data that we're talking about. I should have mentioned, of course, we don't we don't disregard confidentiality and integrity. I have to say that because my executive VP, I'm my boss, I'm the senior STO, and try to all sit. In the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to get to one more uh, question before we open it up to the, to the uh, to everyone. So maybe we can uh, touch on this question quickly. But I think it's important. Um, in Colorado, as I think a lot of states are, we're wrestling with the fact that traditionally our public safety communication network, our 911 network has been provided by one entity, they've been highly regulated, and it's been a very closed network. And we're now looking at the fact that this network is now gonna be a multi-vendor network with a lot of different points and access points and, and people on that network and, and different vendors telling you different things. Um, how do we deal with all these, given that these networks we're talking about are really gonna be the backbone of our public safety for this country, how do we deal with that and what do we as public safety entities need to look at when we go to a vendor and, and ask for, internet connectivity or wireless security or you know help me manage my devices what is it that we need to focus on I think that we need to uh, as the public safety entities work with the vendors when they uh, go out for proposals when they then uh, negotiate services need to be the vent my, my plea I guess to the vendor community is to be flexible and to be supportive um, NextGen 911 to many entities is, is, a, is a relatively new uh, world, and there's a lot of education that goes into that process. Cybersecurity is even newer, and there's a lot of amb ambiguity around cybersecurity. And so having the, the time with their, their trusted partners to uh, work through and be informed on what are the issues at hand, what are the capabilities for me to have me being a public safety entity, to have some view into what's going on in my network and at, be at an applicable level for that, for that entity is important. And an example of that is, uh, is, is one entity may want absolutely nothing to look at. They, want, they just want to know is it green light or red light and they don't even want to look at the light, they just want a, a phone call when something goes, goes bad. Uh, another one may want to have some capabilities for SMMP traps and have some capabilities of having a view, more view ca or view capabilities of a lot of in insight to what's going on in that network. And there's there's things that fall there's people that are going to fall in between in, in between there. Additionally, they want to have a capability to have a an auditor such as those that sat on boards earlier, uh, somebody that is a a trusted cybersecurity auditing entity to come in and be able to provide a, a trusted third-party audit of that system uh, from an application level uh, within the code itself as well as within the network to understand what are the potential vulnerabilities, where can we optimize this network so that, it, so that it's going to provide us with the availability and with the critical services that, it's, that are in place, that it's, that are, it's delivering. Um, speaking as an ISP, so I'm a vendor, I'm a partner, I'm a provider, I, you know, I, I can play plenty, many, many, many hats. I, I would comment that um, the nature of the conversation that the communication service providers have with the public safety community is very, 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 very similar to the same conversations that we have with the electric services guys, the oil and natural gas guys, the financial services guys, people who have high impact services that they deliver to the country. High, high impact. You know, you like getting a paycheck. It's a good thing. You like having heat. It's cold, you know. Um, and the nature of the conversation is, has, has flipped a lot in the eight years that I've been doing this kind of work with other sectors and, and other partners. Um, certainly, there's been a, a long season where we talked about, um, um, if you will, the physical security of stuff, you know, you know. Do you have guns, guards, and gates around your central office? Yes, we do. 
Um, you know, those kind of questions, very, very much focused on the physical stuff. And then, of course, for the last you know, four or so years, it's been all about cyber. Do you use the cybersecurity risk? Yes, we do. We even know all of them. We helped write it. Yes, we do. Um, what we're now starting to see, though, is that there's increasing recognition that the cyber and the physical um, uh, coexist and that cyber enables the ability for you to take that call and then to direct people in a vehicle to go help rescue it. So you've sort of got this cyber physical thing, whether it's cyber physical in the public safety domain, whether it's cyber physical uh, you know, in the electric grid or the oil and natural stuff, or, or whether bits and bytes are flowing and, and the stock market's going up. So the ability you know, for the cyber to impact the physical, the physical to impact the cyber, of course, is becoming increasingly important. Well, so that finds yourself going, how do you have a meaningful conversation with these very, very important customers? And we've hmm, finally sort of found ourselves sort of floating back to sort of a mindset, which you've heard me sort of speak to just a little bit, um, is that what is your most important thing? I, I mean, I know what my most important thing is at CenturyLink, or my top five, okay? I, I, but I don't expect you to know that. I, I need to know that. This is what's most important for CenturyLink. I, I know you guys pretty well, but I still am not the public safety guy. I am still not Fedwire. I am not, you know, Duke Energy. I need to hear from those customers, what are the most important things that you're counting on us to help you with so that you can assure your mission? And when we have that answer, then you begin to engage in a dialogue about, well, if that's the most important thing and you can't be down for anything more than two nanoseconds, well, then let's talk about the engineering that would need to go into place and the architecture we need to put in place to be able to facilitate that. So you engage in a serious, serious dialogue. Now, where does this come into a problem? Well, you do have to have the governance to be able to create, hmm, these are the outcomes that I'm seeking. You know, not to come and say, I want X, Y, Z encryption, but to say that along these domains, the encryption would be necessary is helpful. So in essence, come and tell me what the outcome is that you're, what's the goal that you're trying to get so that we can jointly, you know, collaborate to create a, a network strategy that makes sense and delivers what you need to do to, you know, make your mission go through. I would note that the public safety community needs to have that same conversation with the same degree of depth with all their power providers, with the water guys, with the transportation guys, whatever, you know, the same, there's comparable conversations, but we're sitting at an FCC sponsored meeting, so I know it's comms that's sitting here. So, um, so in my mind, what we're increasingly finding, and one of the things that we have been working on over the past year in the sector level has been working with NIST on that we're calling their community resiliency framework. And it doesn't answer your question in terms of what to say, but it is an incredibly, I think, valuable way to sort of think about it at a much higher level, at a governance level, about all the things that you rely on to deliver your most important services and how you can engage with the communications providers, the power providers, the water providers, the whatever. And in that respect, I think that would be very valuable and I think would be um, help us create a, a mutually, well, a secure and available and confidential and high integrity network for your uh, citizens. Thank you, uh, Anna. I, I think what you're describing is a great question because it, it, to me, is one of the biggest challenges I see as we go forward that in public safety, we, in the past with legacy uh, networks, ha have had a few number of vendors uh, and quite often very proprietary approaches to uh, not just security, but to interoperability. Uh, and uh, any time there was a, a, a change from one of your vendors to another, it was very hard to contemplate. And the vendors were strongly incented to make that hard so that we'd continue to use that vendor. Um, and we're headed towards a, a, a space which is really seeking, I believe, to bring some more of the agility and the range of selections uh, to uh, this space, uh, like in the internet itself, where you want to have a, a, a number of app providers and, and uh, uh, other systems relationships to bring in the new functionality, where you're going to have a patchwork quilt of vendors. Uh, and e either you're going to uh, go mad by trying to integrate the proprietary nature of all of their security 
capabilities uh, and to ensure that you get the functionality and the security that you want by integrating that. Uh, uh, or, and this is what I think needs to happen, is that public safety needs to define best practices and shared security operations and increasingly communicate that as a requirement for uh, your contract so that when you do an RFP, you're saying, oh, and by the way, it's got to plug into my SOC and it's got to provide this kind of intrusion detection information into my SOC uh, because uh, uh, you're going to be interoperable with a range of other vendors that I already have now plumbed into my shared security operations. Um, recognizing that and recognize, recognizing the challenge of uh, the, the regulatory environment um, it, earlier last year, earlier this year, excuse me, uh, the FCC did a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, around governance because we think this is a challenge right now in that uh, the new relationships in Next Generation 911 and bringing first in on board uh, really have some um, gray areas with, is that something that the local uh, contract should manage or is that something that the state uh, PSCs and PUCs should cover or is that something that really is governed by the, the, the FCC piece? So in the end-to-end -end call, uh, I, I'm very certain that there's uh, government authority to establish what constitutes good enough in that. But where all the dividing lines are between that uh, is, is gray, I think, as we go forward currently. Uh, and we uh, have been building a record around that governance item to uh, help bring better clarity into the, um, look, let's get that end-to-end -end call so that it's highly reliable, uh, and available, uh, and that confidentiality and integrity are uh, uh, covered as well. So again, at, uh, at PSCR, we've had a strong focus on the, on the band 14 providers, where I do envision that, you know, we would have some sort of, of guidelines or standards into you know, the security practices of those, those providers. So when we start talking about ISPs, frankly, that's something that uh, we haven't looked into great detail into. And I kind of, in my mind, just thought they'd be a, sort of a, an untrusted interface where we'd have to have special precautions. I take in. umbrage. <laughs> I'm however, just saying. <laughs> however, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm thrilled cool. to learn that those interfaces could, off, you know, we could also have an impact there. And I look forward to uh, you know, seeing how this proceeds and working with you guys in any way to you know, facilitate that and work together. That's, that's great. So I think we have a few minutes for uh, any questions. Is there any questions? Daryl Branson, is this on? Hello? Carol Branson, uh, Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies. I'm also an officer with the National Association of State 911 Administrators. Uh, bear with me while I try to articulate this. Um, what I've, I've been hearing a lot today, and, and, and I know that there's been, you know, I've been following the work on, on uh, security around uh, next generation 911 as well as FirstNet, and it makes sense that we're trying to build this in from the ground up. What I'm concerned about the most are are not those systems where we're able to we're able to get that that security consideration in there from the very beginning, but those systems that are already in place that are tangential to 911 systems. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, telephone denial of service attacks, which have uh, affected PSAPs recently. Don't even touch the 911 network, but yet they can effectively shut a PSAP down. Um, we have um, an, a lot of agencies ar across the country have uh, interfaces with records management systems, which have uh, access from multiple agencies, multiple points of ingress uh, that interface with their computer-aided dispatch systems, which interface with their phone systems. And so how do we balance this, this, um, this effort and this, this uh, applying of resources to build security into new systems like Next Generation 911 and FirstNet while also trying to safeguard our existing systems like radio over IP and records management systems and things like that. Thank you. Who wants to take that very easy question? <laughs> 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 it's, 
Scott had started there. And uh, Daryl, thanks so much for the not only the great work in Colorado, but the great work at NASDA that, that you guys are doing, uh, uh, pulling together best practices among the states. Um, you know, in the earlier panel, uh, ITIL was mentioned, and ITIL was mentioned in a, in a rather derogatory way uh, as being predictable. Uh, but you know, I've um, uh, in the last uh, uh, five, ten years, uh, had the great good fortune of being able to visit some of the nation's um, nationwide carriers to observe how they do uh, uh, NOC operations and how they do security operations. Uh, and uh, they use ITIL and uh, similar um, frameworks to uh, recognize that not every partner relationship is the same. And it's very important to uh, understand uh, in any partner relationship who's responsible for what uh, and where that responsibility ends uh, uh, so that you're not left with uh, uh, underprotected gaps um, and uh, uh, finger pointing uh, uh, either way. And if you've ever run federated networks, it, you know that tech controls are really good at finger pointing if you let them. Uh, and so I, I think managing those relationships is gonna be critical as we go forward and we need to have a, a way of uh, capturing the standard operating procedures across those interfaces uh, that defines who, who's responsible for what part of security uh, in, in a way that when you see anomalies can rapidly uh, get at um, is that anomalous in the way it requires to follow up and then who does the follow up uh, and then who works the mitigation. Um, so uh, 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 work still to be done, but I, I, I think it's in de defining those relationships and managing them uh, regularly. I think that was good. <clears throat> so Howard Teicher with Radware. <clears throat> Given the panel's focus on availability which is obviously critical from a mission achievement point of view for uh, public safety. Um, do you, could the, could the panelists comment on the potential role of enabling public safety to counterattack against denial of service attacks? Uh, my company manufactures tools that are focused on availability defense, and outside of the US, we find that counterattack against the source of an attack is an incredibly effective deterrent against denial of service attacks. And here in the US, only the DOD is authorized to take those actions. Is and public under, safety. And under very specific authority. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and again, this is almost, I mean, again, police can fire back yeah, at attackers. So it's, well, what and, is the, and, what and is the And you're fully aware, of course, that, that this is being debated publicly right now on the Hill. So on until, up and until whenever Congress decides what the nation wants. Um, you know, I think it's I, th I think it's almost well. We're all just sort of watching the the tennis ball go back and forth. Um, I have observed, not personally, but in hearing listening to a lot of sectors talking about the pros and the cons of this. Um, I think it is a very balanced argument at the moment in terms of is it if it is it is it helpful is it not? I, I've heard both cases, both pro and con from financial services pro and con from um, defense industrial base kind of folks. Um, we, as CARES ISPs, we're not going there. It's, it's clearly against the law for us to do that, period, end of sentence. So, um, so I'm just watching this as an intellectual, if you will. Uh, coming from DOD, I can tell you that counterattack sounds easy. It rolls off the tongue uh, uh, so well. But in order to be effective at counterattack, you have to start work first with attribution. Uh -huh. And attribution's hard, and misattribution happens a lot. <laughs> uh, and I don't see it within public safety's wherewithal to be uh, regularly 99.99% correct at the attribution in any kind of meaningful um, uh, time lane that would have that contribute effectively to your defense. Uh, I, I, I do think, however, instead of focusing on counterattack, focusing on maneuver. That would be a much better military art to, um, to follow, uh, that when you see that you're being attacked, you have pre-worked out a maneuver where you can go to a space that the adversary hasn't discovered that you've got that new configuration or that, 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 that backup uh, reserve mode. 
it, so I, I would say if you want to be responsive uh, and have a, a response built into your defensive architecture, uh, focus more on maneuver than counterattack. Having been in incident response and being the uh, forensic analyst of uh, post-incident response after attacks like the ones you're describing, I can tell you that from our perspective, one out of 50 plus attacks has ever been attributable, uh, attributable directly back to the machine that we would have taken offline. Um, in the other 49 plus instances, it was a system that was hacked by someone else and used to attack us, <clears throat> allegedly. <laughs> so take all the proxies down. How about it? Good luck. From a practical perspective, I would like to emphasize the maneuvering because that's when I, when I talked earlier about we, you might be in an incident and being attacked and you can't get down to communication. So the ability to say, okay, we're going to quarantine this group, you know, and, and maybe it's a secondary device or something else that you that from a so from a public safety practical perspective, I would love to see the, the private sector look and provide opportunities to do just that. Well, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, your time. I think uh, if you have additional questions, you can probably grab anyone here on the panel uh, during the break um, and uh, get those answered.